Excellent. And yeah. hey, everybody, if um, I'm not, I'm not sure if um, uh, anyway, I think this is useful. If you, if you go into Corey Wells's little, little picture and up the upper right of his picture, he press the dot, 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 then you can pin him and see him uh, through the whole presentation. Good idea. Okay. So Lotus Lands Horticultural Practices. So we're going to look at some of the gardens real quick. And I want everyone to uh, enjoy those pictures. But after we those first few slides, we're going to, we'll start the actual presentation on the sustainable practices. And we're going to talk about three main areas. Fertilizers, organic fertilizers, compost and mulches, and then all about insects in that third section. So, let's so here's a shot of the Japanese garden. We just finished building this and they spent millions of dollars and it's just gorgeous. It's got a state-of-the-art pump system. It's got a 200,000 gallon pond, viewing platforms, new bridges, all new landscape. And uh, I can't wait for you guys to come and see this. There's the water with some of the koi Cruising around. You can see the water quality is exceptional now. The pond is uh, state-of-the-art lined and uh, multiple filter systems. See the water lilies there. And there's a little bit of a panoramic shot almost there with the new uh, little uh, Japanese pergola up there, which is uh, actually can fit about 30 people in that thing. It's actually quite large and it's, it's handicap accessible too. So this, this garden has really, really been taken up to a very high level now, and, uh, and people that have come here have really enjoyed seeing it. So that's the Japanese garden. Now this is the bromeliad garden where we have an excellent uh, bromeliad garden split in two halves. There's an upper and lower bromeliad garden. This is the upper bromeliad garden. And bromeliads grow very well in coastal California. So this is a great plant. You guys have probably seen this at the florist shops. But you can have an entire collection of just bromeliads, which and we have a really creative gardener in that area, and he's done a fabulous job laying these out. Here's a shot of the lower brom bromeliads under that Montezuma cypress. These are actually just a small little windows into these gardens. These gardens are, are quite long. They're the size of a football field in most cases. So there's quite a bit to see when, in any one of the gardens. Lotus Land has probably nine different main gardens and then many uh, uh, adjacent areas which are smaller gardens. And each area is somewhat shielded from, uh, from the next. So you can, you're kind of in, what, from a designer standpoint, the garden rooms. So it's very intimate. As you move through the gardens, you're kind of hidden in these areas and have, the, uh, have them all to yourself and then you move to the next area. And then uh, the, one of the largest collections in the world of rare plants is Lotus Land's Cycad Garden. And this is the three male plants of Encephalartos woodii. And these are uh, some of the more famous plants at Lotus Land. You can see the cones in the top of the uh, plant there. These are plants, these were actually branches removed from a very large plant, which is the last one in existence. It's in South Africa and it's still alive. Many uh, branches have been taken off. We were able to get three and, and they grow very well at Lotus Hand above this pond. So we have many types of cycads. It's an entire collection that is uh, we're very proud of and we uh, actively pollinate the cones and trade the seeds and grow the seeds. And then my favorite right now is this garden. It's on the cover of our magazine last month the Insectary Garden. This is my personal uh, uh, creation with designer Eric Nagelman and uh, it came out wonderfully and uh, it's, an, it's exemplary for sustainable horticulture, attracting beneficial insects, and just good gardening all around. But all none of this would actually be possible if it weren't for the genius of the lady that purchased the property in 1941, the famous Madam Gonovalska. She was an exceptional person with, who could imagine the future like no one else. She was obsessed with art, opera, costume, Eastern philosophy, 
creativity of all sorts. Quite an interesting, interesting person growing up in Poland, moving throughout Europe, marrying several times to uh, very wealthy uh, gentlemen and some, three of them were, or two or three of them were American industrialists. And that's how she found her way to Santa Barbara where she f purchased her final estate. But she was so far ahead of her times, so I just can't emphasize that enough. She was a huge fighter for women's rights and other disenfranchised groups. Uh, and she, she seemed to have just endless energy and creativity and she lived to be a hundred approximately and was gardening right up to the end. Madam Ganovalska, or simply the Madam. Now, we can begin the rest of our presentation. Lotus Sands very proud of what we've created, this organic garden system. But it, uh, I'd have to say it wasn't always like this. When I first arrived at Lotus Sands 30 years ago, they used a lot of chemicals and the plants were not that healthy. It seemed like wherever you turned, you had disease. We used a lot of synthetic fertilizers like miracle Grow, Osmoco, Peters, all those different cheap, but very readily available and very advertised products. And we knew there was something wrong, but we just couldn't quite figure out how to fix it. And it seemed like everywhere we turned, we were reacting to another problem. Plants were sick, what do you do? And we just kept trying harder and harder using this conventional approach and all the uh, ag advisors that were available at the time. But what we found was by using the organic fertilizers, composts and mulches, beneficial insects and all sorts of insectary plantings, that we could dramatically lower disease and pest issues. We could actually lengthen the life of all the plants at Lotus Land and increase the quality of the flowers, fruits, cones, and foliage. So let's talk about that first area, the organic fertilizers. Now, what's interesting is once we got off of these organic, uh, the chemicals, the organic fertilizers really were one of the first keys to the whole equation. We didn't realize how important they were. They feed the soil organisms so beautifully that the worms just multiply and multiply. And they improve the quality of the soil, the, the texture, the structure of the soil in addition. And that was just the beginning. It happened, it's, it's almost as if we stumbled upon this new algorithm that was going to solve many of our problems, including problems like root knot nematode. These are diseased roots caused by a microscopic worm. This was one of the main problems we had throughout the root systems of almost in every collection at Lotus and just about around 89, 1990, 91, 92 in the very beginning. We also had rose problems. We had rose thrip. We thought, oh my God, look at these bugs are inside the flower. Why is there so many? Why is the flower deformed? Why are we not getting the, the proper formation of flowers? We had aphids on the roses. Why are there so many aphids? Why are they going up and down the stems like that? What are What is making them so attractive? What's happening with the plants that's making them so attractive by these insects? White flies came then, and then exotic white fly species came. New bugs came, and we, we just were getting more worried. These things were happening more frequently. And then we started getting scale too. And it wasn't just on a few plants. It was pretty much on throughout all the gardens, had a little bit of these problems everywhere. So we really had nowhere to turn, but to start over, to come up 
with a completely new shift in our consciousness, a paradigm shift, a new algorithm, an entirely new system based on applied ecology, based on living soil organisms, living insects, beneficial insects, and quality organic inputs. Here's the label of the first fertilizer we started applying in massive amounts. As you see, if you look carefully, you see the ingredients, alfalfa meal, cottonseed meal, kelp meal, fish meal, feather meal, all ingredients that you could understand. Didn't have to be an expert. You could just see these are ingredients that I can understand. They come from whole food sources. That was one of the biggest breakthroughs right there. No more miracle grow. It turned out that the miracle grow was actually too strong, too powerful, too much growth in the plant, too much sugar being produced by the plant shooting up into the stems. That's why the bugs were there. So over 40 acres, after 30 years of trial and error, we are positive. This is one of the main problems with gardens. Too much water soluble synthetic fertilizers like miracle Grow, Peters and Osmocote. I'm not saying they don't work. They work too good, way too good. They bypassed all the worms and bleach the soil clean and go right into the plant. That's the problem. That's it. So this slows down the process, feeds the worms, and creates beautiful, beautiful plants like these roses. When we started getting these results, we realized, oh, now hang on. This is different. After go, okay, but that's one year. Well, how about the next year? Same thing again. And the next year, same thing again. The roses every year looked the same. That's when we started realizing it was duplicatable. As long as we stuck with the highest quality organic fertilizers that we understood, the alfalfa, fish, kelp, we were going to be in really good shape. Really, really good shape. All of those bugs, I'd say 80% of our problems were just caused by the synthetic fertilizer. But then we decided, well, if this is working so good, let's really take a look at the soil and find out what's going in, in so, on in that soil as these organic fertilizers are working on those roses. So we looked carefully and we saw these organisms under the microscope, amoeba, bacteria, top right, amoeba, top left, fungi, bottom left, and there's the nematode, the one that caused that awful deformation of the roots on the bottom right. But it turns out there are hundreds of species. Most of them are beneficial. Only a couple of these, and that's true with all these groups, only a couple are pathogenic or cause problems. When you get on the organic system, these, all these beneficial organisms come to the forefront and all the bad ones get minimized. That's what you got to learn. And it's so simple. There are many, many brands of organic fertilizers on the market. And I sent a link to Steven and Weege. And so they'll give you that form, that uh, resource page. And you can look at the list. You don't have to even write this down. But things like Whitney Farms and um, uh, other organic brands all have the alfalfa meal in there, usually in the fish and kelp. And that's going to feed these organisms. And the beauty is these organisms are going to create the nutrients in the exact form that the plants want, their favorite form, in the right location, right at the root tip, at the exact time they need it, right in spring. That's really important because the timing is critical. If we get the roses or some other plant to grow, Right now, going into Christmas, it's too early. Some plants, if you get them to grow now, will burn from the frost, right? They're not supposed to grow till the spring. We can trick them with miracle Grow, 
but that would be a mistake. So we're talking about getting in tune with the seasons also. Once you're in tune with the seasons, you're in tune with this organic fertilizer, you're in tune with the life of the soil. Now let's look a little more carefully. Now we're just gonna look at the fungi. Look at all the colors. Turns out most of them are beneficial. Let's look even closer. Look at this one. All of that white webbing, that's actual fungi. And what's it doing? It's attaching to the roots of those plants. I, this is an incredible, incredible discovery. It's feeding the roots. So the fungi has fused and has become a mutualistic or symbiotic organism with the trees. 95% of all plants have this on earth. This is something we have to protect. So if you'd use miracle Grow or Osmocote or one of those chemical fertilizers, this is depressed and it slows down. With the organic fertilizers and healthy soil, this flourishes. Look at this now. This picture on the, this larger image, it's in gray. That's one cell. That's showing the fungi inside the cell, feeding it in that massive tree-like formation. So that's the real secret of the universe right there. That's actually how big of organism this fungi is inside the cell, not hurting it, it's feeding the cell. This is how, this is what's happening on the electron microscope level. So once we saw this, we knew we were on the right track. We had healthy fungi with healthy plants. This is our compost tea brewer. Now you can actually brew compost in this thing and spray it on the plants. And you can add a little bit of fish that's water soluble and kelp that's water soluble. And it makes an excellent carrier for foliar feeding. Many of your more tender plants like begonias, ferns, and roses, they will feed very nicely through the foliage in addition to the roots. So this is a fun way to do it. You don't have to have this, but we have very valuable plants and so we get to spoil them a bit. You can just take, uh, you can buy that liquid fish and kelp at the corner of nursery though, and that works good as a foliar application to, your, uh, to all your cut flowers and things. Here's the guy spraying it in the fern garden. And you can see many of these plants or begonias are normally very tender, but they will grow through a little bit of frost, no problem at all, no disease. They bloom great and the foliage is exceptional, tough and leathery, no disease. The only thing that sometimes we have trouble with is rabbits and we sometimes use the have a heart traps or put a little fencing around to protect our plants, but it pretty much 365 days of the year, the plants are ready to go for a tour. Now this is an interesting shot here because this begonia, this cane begonia in the middle of the picture is actually not growing in the soil. It's growing out of that rock. That rock is porous and the porous nature of that rock allows it to soak up some of that compost tea with fish and kelp and that biology. So somehow the plants that sprout on these porous rocks now are able to grow into full size plants with flowers and everything without any soil. That's when I knew we've really stumbled upon a miracle. This is incredible. Plants and seedlings and hybrids sprouting randomly on these rocks which never had plants on them before. Well, does anyone have a quick question? Maybe you can chat it or unmute yourself. Anything about or these organic fertilizers and how well they heal the soil and grow plants. And anyone can do this. Weege, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I wonder, I had some, um, a lot of native plants uh, recently added to my garden and um, the person who did that, Chris Eppington, a lot of us know her, um, complained that my soil was too rich <laughs> for, for native plants because I've spent a lot of time, you know, adding compost and straw and um, everything to make 
my soil um, nice and healthy. But is it true that that you can go too far if you're trying to grow natives, which are used to the kind of thinner soil? Boy, that's around? a good question. Boy, weeds does not waste any time cutting to the chase. This is one of the best questions. When I love to use a lot of compost in organic fertilizers and volcanic ash minerals, which have everything in the periodic table. And that's great, especially for cut flowers, things like that. Think about it, native plants grow up here in the chaparral and in these rolling hills. They don't have any amendment in them, in that soil. They have, a, they have an adequate amount of organic matter. So if you amend your soil, you're probably getting it ready for a rose garden or a cut flower garden or vegetables. That's actually too rich for native plants. Now there are some natives that will thrive in that though. You can still plant California fuchsia and you can plant cyanothus pretty well. Um, uh, quite a few of the, uh, even I, I would, I would even say, uh, even the um, some California fescues and uh, anything riparian, you know, some of the higher water plants, they go wild in that rich soil. But in general, California natives can be planted in unamended soil, and I would loosen the soil very deeply with your shovel, and then try not to ever walk on it if you can, so don't make the beds too wide, and then you can mulch, and that's it. They don't need any fertilizer usually. Some people do use a little bit of kelp, you know, a little water soluble kelp, maybe half strength fish in there too. And they seem to like that, but they take a very lean diet. So yeah, I love to have my natives and my non-natives, but I treat the soil very differently. I love roses and dahlias and cut flowers and pumpkins and vegetables and things. Those I go crazy with the compost and I've had really good results. You saw the roses. We keep them high in organic matter and rich compost. And we're going to talk about that next, actually. That's our next, that's our next topic. Maybe time for another couple questions. No, oh, I got a question. Um, Steven here. <clears throat> so rebuilding the soil culture, should I be purchasing worms and nematodes and all of that to supplement the soil? Or should I just kind of let that naturally come in? A lot of my beds aren't necessarily part of a larger like yard per se they're kind of concreted off so i'm wondering once i get all the fertilizer up and going like how then do i promote more of those little bugs the beneficial bugs and stuff that's another fantastic question most of these organisms are already in the environment it's almost hard to stop them from coming in so you really have nothing to lose but just have at it with the amending have at it with the organic fertilizer you're gonna get great results right away. You can augment by going to someone who's got an older farm-like area maybe with, who's been mulching and composting for a while and they seem to be getting great results and it's all natural. You can take a little bit of their soil and sprinkle it in your soil and actually it'll inoculate it, but you don't always have to. Life wants to happen. And these organisms, these beneficial insects too, which we'll talk about, they're already in the atmosphere. They're all around us. We just have to stop using those chemicals and start having faith in these organic fertilizers. It's a very quick learning curve. Anyone can do this. We're working with just organic products that you can understand. You see the label, you read it. Bring your glasses if you need to. I need to use my glasses for that small print and make sure it doesn't say you know, ammonia and all these chemical words on there. Make sure it says organic and those worms those organic organisms, they will migrate in. Some of them migrate in the air. Remember uh, spores of, uh, of fungi and bacteria, they're all everywhere in the environment. And so the good ones will like that rich soil and they'll start to help you improve it. I can't tell you the transformation I've seen over 30 years of just steady mulching, steady organic fertilizer, not a lot, just a little bit over and over and year by year, we're able to grow more plants than just about anyone in the world here with our mild climate and our amended soil. And we started with rocky mountain soil. If you, let, me, uh, let me be clear about this. We're not down on that bottomland, farmland soil. We're up at 550 elevation in the Chaparral Oak Woodland. So there's boulders and rocks in the soil, but we work around that. We do the best we can with the soil we have. Some areas are a little better but we amend it and 
all the good stuff migrates in. You almost, you just can't stop it. Life wants to happen. It takes a lot of chemicals and a lot of smashing and compacting of the soil to actually mess it up. So just don't do that and start doing this good stuff and treating your soil gently. Does that okay. answer your question, Steve? I, I, have, I have a question. Uh, I don't the, the, with uh, what, what about tillage? In other words, uh, I, I find it, 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 it you can get in trouble putting uh, organic materials too deeply into a soil uh, that they work best in the in the top eight inches to a foot. Uh, how do you treat uh, uh, tillage and, and working the, the compost into the soil? That's another great question. I do the same thing. Finish good quality compost, and it's got to be finished. If you're not sure if it's finished, I'd leave it in that top on the surface for a while till it breaks down. I work it just like you into that top foot or so. You can go a little deeper if your soil's light, but if you go real deep and you have heavy soil, it becomes an anaerobic mess down there. You can't get enough oxygen down there, holding too much moisture. And then now tillage is another subject in altogether there. So compost, you know, like something like 80% of a tree's roots are in that top foot of soil. So, I mean, that is the magic layer. So we don't want to drive that compost too deep. Finish compost on the surface, but tillage, now busting up the soil, like a farmer dragging his plows across those fields, they have to be very careful. You have to have the right moisture. And we, since we have relatively small gardens at our homes, we can actually break up that soil thoroughly with our shovels. We can amend if we need to or not if it's natives. And then we try to build the beds so they're not too wide, so you don't have to step in there and stomp around. That's a key thing. So tillage really doesn't do anything if you later compact it by walking around in there. So try to build your beds narrow, maybe two, three, four feet wide and long. And that'll really help you never having to till that soil because you go to all that work to amend it, to loosen it up, to get the right moisture, carefully pick out the right plants. The last thing you want to do is have it compacted again. So compost, tillage, and compaction, those, that's, those are the three main ideas we're talking about here. Compost, not too deep, but make sure it's finished compost, a good quality one. Tillage, one time if it needs it, never again maybe. Just add a little bit more compost if needed to the surface and try to stay off that land. You can throw your mulch in there. You don't have to stomp around in there. You will be rewarded with plants that grow longer, better than you can ever imagine. Does that answer the question, you guys? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, if I have uh, young compost that I want to spread, I'll only spread it a few inches deep. There you go. That's what, I agree with that, yeah. You'd be amazed. Even later, though, as your soil gets stronger and healthier, it breaks down everything much faster and is more resilient to just about any kind of weird thing that happens. It actually begins to digest even chemicals, if there's any in the area, and render them in forms that are harmless. So that's how they do bioremediation. You can actually digest oil. That's how they go after oil spills and things. They, they can actually get biology to digest even oil. So healthier soils become super soils years down the road. Super soils, very little disease. The only thing you might work, worry about is gophers or something like that. Okay, one more question, I'll get rolling. Anyone else? Good, okay, here we go. So now we're in that organic matter. How do you say, is it the vidrins, is that right? Vidrin? Yeah. Hi, you guys. Um, so here's, now this, that's a good time to go into organic, man. Look at the, here's our, here's one of our older pictures. We have a better system than this. Now here's basically sifting rough compost on a pretty massive scale using the tractors and the trucks and we've already flailed it. But here's how the whole system works. Watch this. Raw materials piled and it just is from every garden and it's just about anything you can imagine. And we flail it with a very primitive flailing system. It doesn't have to be expensive. I wish I had one of those tub grinders, but they're, you know, $300,000 or more, you know. Then we pile it up and water it, and we let natural thermophilic bacteria get in there and do the work. We can be very lazy, actually. You know, we pick, once this piles up, 
we may only have to turn it, you know, two, three, four times over the course of a few months, and we end up with some beautiful product. Look at that. That is some beautiful finished compost. It's pretty much stable at this point. It's no longer hot. It still has worms in it. It's still slightly moist. But this will grow amazing vegetables, amazing roses, amazing cut flowers, begonias, ferns, all those high, heavy feeding plants. Even some of your palms and cycads love this stuff. They love it. Even remember aloes like this too. A lot of your aloes. I wouldn't do this for cacti though. Cacti, very small amount, mainly a coarse sand treatment for them. They love that drainage, but they do have to have a little bit of real soil mixed with the sand, just a small amount and a little bit of compost to bring it to life. That's good quality compost right there. Now here's a little bit, this is a mulch now. It looks like compost, but it's actually a finely ground uh, redwood forest product mulch. This is a beautiful grade for around the roses on the surface. We've been using this for decades and just about every rose society grower around here loves this product. It's a very finely ground one. It's not eucalyptus. It's a little bit of redwood, a little bit of forest products, and it composts down in about, oh, I'd say three or four months from a five, four or five inch layer down to about a one inch layer. And that's exactly the schedule you want. It turns into compost just at the right schedule. Now here's redwood, I mean, uh, eucalyptus chips. This makes great pathways and can be spread around the perimeter of a property. I would not put this on your roses though. This is a little bit too rough. And being from Australia, the native biology doesn't understand what that is. It's gonna have different chemicals in it. It's not bad. It's just gonna slow everything down. So don't put this on your delicate plantings. Put this on some of your larger stuff at the edge of your garden, around the parking areas, around the bigger trees, maybe not on your delicate plantings. Go with that uh, finer products, finer products. Okay. Any questions about organic matter now? Any about mulches, about buying mulches? We know we want finer textured. We can use eucalyptus, but hopefully it's ground fine and hopefully it's not gonna go down on your delicate plantings. I have had some luck with eucalyptus. You know, that's one of the main ones you're gonna get is eucalyptus. Everyone has eucalyptus chips. It's just, by and large, that's what the tree companies are cutting down, eucalyptus trees. They also come by oak. Sometimes you have ash and you know everything else, willow and tipuanu and fig and whatever else they're, they're chipping. But try to make sure they chip that stuff real fine for you when you use it for a mulch. Any questions from anybody about mulches? How deep? Oh, what are the benefits? Holding in water, things like that. Everyone's good on the there. Okay, Weege, we're gonna keep going forward. Okay, now here's my favorite part, the insects. The insects. How do you pull in the natural allies, the beneficial insects? Turns out you don't have to buy even one if you don't want to. You don't have to buy any ladybugs or anything. You can simply grow beautiful plants and they will pull in the natural beneficial insects that you need for your garden. And you're gonna have the list from that insectary garden I showed at the beginning. I gave the list to Weege and Stephen, Stephen. So they they have, their list is on its way to you. It's everything you have in the garden. And you'll notice on that list, it's about 50% native plants. So just remember that ratio. That's all you have to remember. Try to use 50% natives and all the natives bring in beneficial insects. And of the non-native plants now, like your like lavender, that's not a native plant, or many of the salvias are not native. If you're gonna use those, make sure they're from this list because those are the right ones. So don't lose that list. Now here's, some of the, here's what some of the beneficial insects do. See this little wasp in the upper right? Look what it's doing. It's stinging that microscopic aphid one at a time. And on the next slide underneath it, Hundreds of baby wasps have emerged from those aphids. That's the genius of applied entomology, beneficial insects. One wasp with pollen and nectar from your insectary plants that you're gonna plant will lay hundreds of eggs. 
If you get this concept, you're well on your way to a sustainable garden. On the left, we have a ladybug showing you how it's relatively big compared to the aphids, which are underneath it. And on the bottom left, that's a baby ladybug. They actually eat more aphids than the adult. Oh, here's a funny little slide I slipped in on our new cactus garden just so you have an idea what it looks like. We have that enormous uh, cactus garden, which just came out fantastically beautiful. So here's some pictures now of me building a state-of-the-art insectary garden. Here's the before, and there's after. See, there's before, and then you see the guys, and there's after. Same angle. It took about two years for those plants to fill in. So you see these uh, perennial plants really fill in quite fast and they produce a lot of pollen nectar very quickly. So it gets your insects up and running quickly. That's the main idea there. Notice how the plants are filling in too. That's gonna keep all the weeds down. We won't have to do as much mulching once they're all fit together. Here's before, after. Same angle, there's see the oak tree in there. Before, there's the oak tree in the middle. There's the oak tree after, so it's the same angle. So that's about two years. Then one more time, right down the middle of the garden. Got the bird cage placed, still under construction. And then after, bam. So I can't tell you how fun it has been. I've waited 25 years to build this garden. And we got the donations and we hit it out of the park a home run on all levels. All the beneficial insects came right on time. These plants were chosen based on what UC Davis and Berkeley recommend too. So remember, there's a lot of research behind this garden. Now let's take a quick look at some of those bugs. That's a native bee. That's a native longhorn bee. It's on flax, that beautiful purple flower. You can see it looks kind of like a honeybee, but it's got green eyes, a little different. And look at this one the blue orchard bee. Very fast, very efficient at pollinating. One of these bees is equal to 100 honeybees. That's how good a pollinator it is. That's why it's so important to use some of these native flowers like poppies, lupin, this is gilia. Oh, you can use phacelia, five spot, baby blue eyes. These are all great native flowers. I would probably start with poppy, lupin, and phacelia. Tennessee to folia, those three, poppy, lupin, and phacelia, those are the three easiest ones. And you're gonna get these kinds of beautiful flowers, like the ones behind, uh, behind me after this slideshow I'll show you. Uh, those are the easiest, because they'll, they'll even come through mulch. So you don't have to worry about scraping all the mulch out of the way. Most native annual flowers, which are the fun ones to grow, do require you to scrape that mulch out of the way. Now this bee here is an interesting bee, this bee, actually followed the Native American tribes from Mexico into North America 5,000 years ago. Pumpkins, which this is a pumpkin flower, this is a squash bee, pumpkins evolved and have been in North America farmed by indigenous peoples for 5,000 years. That is an interesting fact. In parts of Mexico up to 7,500 years ago, Pumpkin is part of our heritage and all the squash and gourds and things like that. This is the bee that pollinates a pumpkin or a zucchini. Now here's one of your uh, uh, native flowers, the Pacific blue salvia. And there's one of your native bees coming up, getting a little bit of pollen, coming in for a landing. They're very fast. And if you look, if you notice that bee, look at all the little hairs on it. All that's designed to help scatter that pollen around. So there's a, there's a genius to the design of these bees. They move very quickly. And once you have a few of these flowers in your garden, I want you to start looking for these. You can see these bees. If you look carefully, you'll see it's gonna look a little bit like a honeybee, but it might be a little more silver. Might be moving around a little bit more like a fly. That's probably gonna be some of your native bees. In the San Clemente area, you have fantastic native bees down there. They're ready to go to your garden. You've just got to follow that list of some of these native salvias and some of the other salvias too. Your You'll see that a lot of your favorites are on that list. Now here's one of my all-time favorites. This is the leaf cutter bee. This one's, notice where the pollen is on this bee. Look at the abdomen. 
the pollen on this, this is a female bee, because male bees don't collect pollen, right? And females do all the work. The pollen is on the abdomen. This bee cuts a little circle of rose from a rose bush and places it on her egg in a little cell in the ground. She's a very delicate task. She lives by herself in the ground. The leaf cutter bee. Here's one of my all time favorites too, the sweat bee. This is the female metallic green sweat bee. This is actually quite common in San Clemente gardens. If you plant an aster like this one, this is aster Fricardii munch, M-O-N-C-H. It's basically any of the asters, A-S-T-E-R. All the asters do a great job of bringing in these metallic sweat bees. These are in the San Clemente area and they're very easy to attract. Oh, and that facilia wanted to, I was telling you about lupin and poppy. This is the facilia. Now you can buy these, these seeds and I'll have to send another link. So I have a link for where you can buy these seeds cheap. American Meadows. American Meadows is one of the best seed producers and they you can buy a bag that will cover 10 backyards cheap. American Meadows. That's Facilia Tennessee defolia. Has a long bloom time and it's one of the easiest dynamite California native flowers to throw around. It's as easy as poppies. I don't know why everyone doesn't use this one. It blooms almost longer than the poppy, I think. Now this is gold fields. This is one of the trickier ones. Now you got to pull that mulch back to grow this one. That's a real pretty one. But you got that one wants bare soil. Many of your California natives want bare soil. They don't like that mulch in there. They need to be in contact with that and they don't like to be buried. Right on the surface, you wet it right about this time of year. This is your go time. This is the time of year, winter. That's when your California natives go. And here's the lupin with some facilia mixed in. Lupin's a very easy flower to grow. The seeds are quite large beans and it'll grow through the mulch just fine. Now perennials, you may have seen this flower at your nursery. This is blanket flower. It's a North American native. This is Gallardia or blanket flower. This particular variety is called Goblin. This is very common at uh, even the Home Improvement Centers, Home Depot. Many of the nurseries carry this flower. It really brings in native insects very well. It's, it's a lot of fun to grow too. And this one does not need any amending. So you can just, it will reseed in unamended soil beautifully. Here's Bidens. This is also it sold at Home Depot or other big box stores, nurseries. Uh, this comes in six packs and actually forms a nice little low clump about a foot tall. Very good for bringing in insects. Let's take a quick look now and shift gears just slightly and look at some of the butterflies that were attracted when I finished my garden. Here's the great hair streak. This butterfly only lays eggs on mistletoe. Very interesting. So to me, I'd never seen this before. The colors are so unique. I was just startled when I took this picture. This is a painted lady, a fairly common butterfly in San Clemente as they migrate through. But it's the, the good thing to take away from this picture is that flower. That's Duranta repens. D-U-R-A-N-T-A, -A, Duranta. That's one of the good ones. And as long as you get a good variety that does not have any spikes on the plant, it is the toughest plant you can grow for a big shrub in, your, in the back of your garden, Duranta. I can't tell you, it's a nine out of 10. It almost is a 10 out of 10 of one of the best flowers that are gorgeous and blooms for a long time, Duranta and Painted Lady. Here's the variable checker spot. And it's on one of the native verbenas, Verbena de la Mina. Fairly common native plant you can buy at most nurseries. Variable checker spot butterfly. Here's the Gulf butterfly, Gulf fritillary. And it's also on Verbena. Many, there's many verbenas you can buy at the nursery too, not just one. There's, there's three or four. There's Verbena bonarens. That's an excellent flower for these, uh, for butterflies and for native bees. But one of my favorites, I have to admit, is the swallowtails. The tiger swallowtail, anna swallowtail, and the great swallowtail. These are large butterflies, sometimes bigger than monarchs. 
and I, I really have to admit, I do grow this Buddleia. Now, remember, when you grow Buddleia, it likes a lot of compost and some and a little bit extra water. If you in there, you can dig the compost down a little deeper too. If it's good quality compost, to Donna and her husband, shout out. You can dig that compost a little deeper in this one. You can kind of go crazy with the compost on this one. Mine are 15 feet tall and 20 feet wide almost. I've never grown such big buddleias, and they don't have any of that leaf curl problem or look ratty and they bloom three times a year instead of once. And you can hack it back by 50% every year and it'll shoot out again. I am really happy, really, really happy. In fact, I did so much amending, many of those buddleias are sprouting up randomly in the garden and they have this gorgeous magenta color too. So when you start getting your garden amended, kind of like Weege's garden, you'll start seeing some of these non-natives that sprout on their own and now you have free plants. So let's look at this picture. Here's a map of lotus land. Look, these are all the areas on 40 acres that I put the insectary strips. And some of these areas aren't quite as fancy as the pictures I showed you. That was the bee in the middle there, that round circle, the butterfly garden. That is where the butterfly garden is. But these other colorful squares and circles are all habitat areas. So this could be a representation of your patio. And these would just be different potted plants maybe that are beneficial for beneficial insects. So you can have your roses or your rare plants and still have the insect free plants in addition right adjacent to them. Or if you have a big property, you grow big hedgerows. That's how the insect free system works uh, kind of strategically. Any questions about beneficial insects and how to attract them, how to acquire beneficial insects for the garden, or what is a beneficial insect? Weed, are you still with me? Yep, I'm still there. Okay, I'm, did you see all those pictures? Yeah, beautiful stuff. Hey, I wonder about the, the Bodleia, the butterfly bush. Yeah, um, that's a good one. I thought I saw somewhere about how that can become a nuisance in the in the wild. Um, yeah, in, in some states, it's illegal to plant. In Oregon and some of the higher rainfall states, you don't want to plant it there. Because you get so much rainfall, it can naturalize, which it has, and it becomes a roadside weed. Do you think that's a problem in Southern California? <laughs> uh, no. I wouldn't think so, but I, I thought it was uh, specific to this area. They said no, that. no, 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 no. They, they, they don't pop up anywhere around here, but you're lucky when you get them. I've, I have probably four or five volunteer plants in the garden. And some of them have that exact color of the parent plant that some of the most gorgeous magentas, they're so bright, you can see them 50 yards away. And they bring in those big swallowtails. Um, also, I've seen that um, they have the Budlia in smaller form now. They do, there's Midnight Buzz and all these other interesting ones. Um, I love some of those smaller forms too. Yeah, the big ones get really big. Uh, there's probably a uh, right. hundred different at least maybe more varieties and you can go on some of the websites and see all the different cultivars and it's a lot of fun because there's every color shade you could ever imagine and I, I usually go for those bright magentas i think that's i think that's some of the best ones are those really bright magentas they're just like that color is just so striking in the garden mm -hmm. a, i, I see from lara bard um that there are seedless bodleias on the market now, so I guess those wouldn't even in our oh, there you go. They wouldn't yeah, they in. could plant that. In yeah. Now the only issue I have with some of the hybrids of, and that brings up a good question. When you look at some of these um, flowers, let me see if I can find one fairly quickly here. Um, some of the flowers you'll see these. See how small these flowers are? They're all relatively small flowers. That's what insects like. Insects need small flowers, by and large, really small flowers. Like this one could even be smaller. Think of alyssum or some, one of those really, really compact umbels. Or if you let, a, if you let something like, uh, you know, coriander or one of these herbs go to, go to a, or a fennel, if you let it bloom, it's a, it's a kind of a little umbrella-shaped flower with lots of microscopic flowers on top. 
that's the shape you need to get to bring in insects. So the big giant um, uh, Gerber daisy or something like that maybe, it doesn't have the right pollen or nectar, it's not on our list, and it's a large flower too. Or what's another example? Well, maybe a big trumpet flower or something like that, or a rose. Those are not the right flower to attract beneficial insects. You notice all of our flowers are small, 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 small. Uh, think of yarrow, if you know what that is, native Achillea or native yarrow. It's a very small little umbrella shaped flower. Look at this, or the Budlia, lots of small flowers. That's the uh, same. How, how about uh, plants that attract hummingbirds? Are, aren't they good at pollinating as, as well? You know, it's so funny that you asked that because they told me, they said, look, we'll give you $50,000 if you get to work on this garden, Corey. Get on it. So I started building the garden and they said, I'll, I'll give you another 10,000 if you make it, if you include butterflies, and I'll give you another 5,000 if, if you can include hummingbirds. And it turns out it's almost all the same plants. So I got all the money, built the same garden. <laughs> it's almost all the same plants. Look, this is actually a fantastic butterfly plant, but I've seen native bees going to it. And I've seen hummingbirds going. So many, hummingbirds do like a red tube, but many of my salvias have a red tube. So actually when you plant a butterfly garden and they have that long proboscis tongue, you're really planting a, a hummingbird garden at the same time. And many of the native bees love the same flowers. So once you get in that, once you start using the na that, uh, all native plants and then the 50% the of your garden that's non-native, and I wanna make this point really clear now, I want everyone to pay attention, 50% natives, 50% non-natives, and that's got to come from that list that you have now. We each has the list. He's going to give it to everyone. And Stephen does too. You can still have some of your, you know, roses or cycads or rare palm trees. That's fine. But if your garden is nothing but palms or cycads or roses, it's actually a dead zone. That's what the scientists found out. 95% of what people in San Clemente and Santa Barbara from Alaska to Mexico, 95% of what we put in our gardens are our favorite flower and it's a dead zone. That's the problem. So that's why there's, when you get on board with this plan we've been talking about here, you're actually in tune with every conservation group in California. They would all tell you the same thing, plant natives, because you're not only gonna save water, you're gonna bring in all the native birds, all the native insects, all the native butterflies, all the native beneficial organisms. And you're gonna have less disease on the rest of your plants too. So there's so many reasons to get in sync with sustainable concepts and start moving away from those chemicals. Is that me? I hope not. So that's where we kind of have to ask our question, you know, I have a question. Are we, getting, are we getting something out of all this? Oh, did you have a question? I have a question. Uh, yeah. um, I'd like to get a little more information about planting the wildflowers on like a bank on a canyon that I can't get down to, but I'd like to just grow them and there's no compost, which is bare native soil. Yeah, you know, sometimes that's the only option you have is those steep hillsides to get hopefully get some sun. Yes. Yeah, if you want to, yeah, if you want to plant uh, perennials, some of the chaparral, maybe ceanothus, you know, maybe some of those different more rugged shrubs, um, you might need a drip system, but just a basic one. That's all you need. And this is, you're right in the perfect time right now. I would order your plants now. All winter is the best time to plant. Late fall, winter, very beginning of spring. Don't let you can do that. Yep, that's a good question too. Now the wildflowers, now's the time to put them down. But I would try to get somebody down there with a weed whacker and really knock down any weeds that are down there and rough up and if you can kind of even have them rough the soil up a little bit, that would be great. You really got to give those wildflowers a chance. Stick with poppy, lupin, basilia. Those those three are your are some of the three best ones. 
You can get more, but those three are real good. They're going to come up reliably. You're going to be amazed what's down there. You'll be amazed. And if you put them down now, if you wait till March, no good. They won't, stay. they might sprout, but they won't make it. Is that good? Okay. Okay, good. You can do it. So can we do all this? Well, I think if we move away, like we said, we move away from synthetic fertilizers and replace them with organic fertilizers for those cut flowers that we like. You can see them behind me. We got some salvias, or well, you'll see in a minute. And I can I can see my background. You can't right now, but um, and we start using now liberal amounts of compost and mulches where it's where appropriate. Mulches on the natives, compost on where you want your special flowers. Now your your cut flowers and your vegetables and those sorts of things, your ornamental ornamental plants. And then if we can interject some insectary plantings, make sure we put in some of those natives to attract those beneficial insects. You'll have done the three main parts to the sustainable system. And then all you have to do is close your eyes and just imagine, and that'll give you the faith to follow through on this whole plan. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Nice, nice Corey. Thank you very much. <clears throat> that, was, that was really interesting. I'm inspired. <laughs> um, does Does anyone have any um, any yeah. questions, Corey? I have a question. Um, I'm just curious. Is there any um, I get ants around the house and in my garden, and is there an insect that I should try to get in that will maybe eat the ants so they won't come into my house? That's a great question. Well, you guys have hit, I think, probably four out of four of the top questions that anyone could ask. Now, the ant thing, that's an interesting one. I personally am an applicator, a licensed applicator, so I legally have to attend seminars for 30 years on how to deal with ants, pests, all of it. So let's get that established first. When I started, we were uh, freaking out about ants. And all the universities and ag advisors were telling us, you got to spray them. Put down the most toxic thing you possibly can. You got to kill the queen. So we did that. Didn't work. Ants came right back. What did, I, what did I find out about that synthetic fertilizer we talked about earlier? Oh. Remember? Yes. What was it doing? It was, it was making those plants grow too fast. And the, what was bad about that? Too many sugars in the plants. And what are those beneficial, what are those pest insects like? Sugar. And, my, and the worst ones are your aphids, mealybug, and scale. Those are some of the bad ones. What do the ants do with those? If you know, if you know a little bit about this, they call it the ant aphid complex. The ants drink the honeydew off the tail of the aphid. It's textbook uh, integrated pest management. I don't believe in that whole thing. That only happened because they used the miracle grow. Once I got off the miracle grow, all the ant problems went away on 40 acres. I still have ants everywhere. And they live once in a while, they find a little corner that no beneficial insect gets to and they get a few little scales going, big deal. Am I gonna go out and spray the world because I have a little few ants on one plant and 40 acres? So if you had in your home, if you have a, in your backyard and front yard, if you had one branch on one rose, it had a whole bunch of ants and aphids, wouldn't you rather just blast them off with water or would you rather spray the whole garden and kill all your beneficials? That's how ridiculous it is. We're using a sludge hammer to take care of a problem that a squirt of water can take care of. Once you get off that drug of the chemicals and all those awful pesticides, um, you're, kill you're killing your I beneficials. That's I can make a suggestion too. You could get an aardvark. An aardvark. Yeah, yeah, get an aardvark. They're quite expensive, but you can train them. They're quite large, too, remember? <laughs> um, 
Corey, Laura has asked uh, if you can explain the uh, the current process for visiting um, Lotus Land Gardens. Oh. 805-969-3767. You call, you make a reservation, and they open the gates, and you get a docent-led tour for a couple hours, and then you're on your way. It's that simple. You don't have to be a member, or do you have to, do you have to be a member? Good question. Now, if you're a member, and I suggest that lowest level one, because it pays for itself with two visits, that gives unlimited visits for you. You be the judge, you know, you guys are within striking range. Two trips pays for it. I'm is just it, saying. Is it an annual membership or, or is that? Yeah, is it an annual? annual membership. Not life, okay, perfect, yeah. thank you. Well, they, they have life, they have a Lotus Society. You can go all the way as high as you want. They have, they have multiple layers and there's benefits at each layer, you know, but I, I always say at least get started at the lower one. You'll get the bulletin, I think, you'll get, uh, unlimited access, you know, so that, that, and, cause you're going to learn so much by visiting and seeing this garden, seeing the insectary garden, you're going to learn so much. You're going to want, probably need to come at least a couple times. And plus different things are blooming at different times. Roses, what's that right about May 15th? That's gotta be the peak for the rose garden. If you really like roses, May 15th, if you like Lotus, there's a jazz concert soiree thing we usually throw around June, June, July for the Lotus. That's a really good one. I think it's actually the beginning of July. And then if you're really a high roller, a big event is late July. 500 people, $2,000 a couple to get in, movie stars and the whole bit. So if that's the way you like it. Nice. Whatever floats your boat. <laughs> okay, Corey, we can take one more question. Any? Anybody out there with another question? Yeah, you got me. You ask your question now. Of course, you can always uh, you can always get a hold of me again through email or something. But if you have a question now about your roses or something, I love roses. I love succulents. I love natives. I love insects. Those things I think about an awful lot. I love barn owls. Oh, I have beautiful. all over the garden. I grow barn owls like you wouldn't believe. Dozens. Wow. Easy to grow. Easy. I Beautiful. love these birds. They're, they're, uh, and right now, the gardeners just told me there's two, I think it's the mom and papa or mom and baby, large hawks in my insectary garden, the one I showed you pictures of, and they're almost tame. There's so many little voles running around and things. They're just sitting there, and they're not even afraid of the tours. They just scoop down and grab a rodent and go up in the perch and eat it. It's unbelievable. It's like wild kingdom. Wow. What's that? <laughs> Weege, what's that? Uh, looks like a hamster to me. It does. It looks like a hamster. That's actually one of these weird anomalies. It's a gopher with a hamster coat. Well, I've, I've never seen one like that. I caught it one time and actually released it live because it was so amazing. I, I had to let him go. It's, it's a gopher. <laughs> Okay. Well, Corey, this has been really fantastic. I really appreciate you uh, taking your time to um, to tell us about all these wonderful things you're doing at Lotus Land. Um, and thanks for offering to be available for emails too. We'll we'll include that in the information that we send out your um, your email address, if that's okay. Sure. 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 Okay. Great. Um, all right, so everybody, we can give a, a virtual hand to Corey. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. We really appreciate Thank it. You. And um, now, it's, so everybody, hang on. We'll do a very quick business meeting, and then we'll um, we'll draw for the uh, gift certificates for our local San Clemente merchants. Okay. So Corey, great Bye. to see you. You're welcome to stick around, or you can go ahead and and leave. Thanks, right. Corey. I'm running a little low on time, so I got to roll, but thank you guys. Thank you very good. much. Thanks. Good questions, too. Very good questions. This thank is a you. good group. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so everybody, I uh, just wanted to let you know a few things that the Garden Club has been up to. On Monday, we, um, Stephen, I don't know if you're able to pull up um, the picture from the beach, um, oh, yeah. the beach cleanup. I'm doing just fine. There we go. Yeah, on, on Monday, 
there were eight of us who um, turned out for the beach cleanup at Calafia State Beach. There are seven of us in the picture. Lynn Wolf had, had left already, um, but it started out being a little, little bit drizzly and then it turned into a gorgeous day to be out there on the beach and um, collecting all the little bits of styrofoam and, and stuff that we found on the, on the beach. So that was, that was great. Thanks for everyone who turned up. And um, we will schedule another beach cleanup probably in about six weeks or so. So just hold tight. And, um, and then Stephen, the, the other photo, um, also on Monday, Mary Moore and I, bringing up this photo, were able to um, visit FAM and donate the, the toys that the Garden Club had collected and also a monetary donation to FAM. Um, looks like the picture's not, not coming up, but it'll be in the newsletter. Um, so Mary also was able, here we go, Mary was able to collect um, a million toys through her Pilates group at the Senior Center. Uh, the, the Garden Club collected some toys as well. And um, we were able to give them a check for $180. So that was really nice. The, um, everyone at FAM was pleased that we were able to do that. So thank you everyone for helping out with that. Um, now I'd like to ask Q, I don't know if we can see Q now. Um, Q, if you're still there, can you talk about civic beautification, please? I'm not sure if Q is still. Um, all right. I don't see Q. Hey, Carol Lutz, can yes. you talk briefly about civic beautification? I can. I can jump in. Um, there were five or six of us today. We went, we went to Park Semper Fi and were there for about an hour doing a lot of trimming and cleaning. Um, Q is going to set it up that we will meet one, one week on a Wednesday at, at uh, the CASA and then an alternate week we'll meet at Park Semper Fi. So we're going to switch, she was going to switch the days to Tuesday, uh, from Tuesday to Wednesday and we'll meet at nine o'clock. She'll be sending out another email, but Park Semper Fi has been neglected for a long while. So there are a lot of leaves, a lot of trimming, deadheading that needs to be done. So she is hoping to get people to help us. Okay. All right, thanks, Carol. Okay, um, Michelle will read something that came from the Junior Gardeners. Uh, Michelle, Michelle, can you unmute? Just <clears throat> press the unmute at the bottom left. There you go. Okay. So the schools are not allowing visitors on their campus so we can help on weekends. Palisades Elementary is preparing for their new garden. They have space already, space ready. Dirt has been delivered and garden boxes are ready. If you can help on the weekends, please let me know. Shore Cliffs is doing fantastic. The garden there has been working for 11 years. Las Palmas Garden is running. Moorhead has a beautiful garden and is doing great. They are in need of a truck to haul dirt. If anyone can help reach out to me and I will give you a teacher to contact. Santa Monica. Oh, we're getting some kind of feedback. Hey, uh, Stephen, are you able to, to mute everyone except for Michelle? Wow. It sounds like whales. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, that sounded like some kind of whales mating or, <laughs> yeah. or something. And then Michelle, right. you just have to unmute. Yeah, I Michelle, can't. unmute yourself again. I see it. Okay. 
Uh, San Clemente High School has a beautiful garden and this will be the first year that they are reaching out to our club. Vista Del Mar has a great garden space. They are in their second year of gardening and they have great plans. Lobos, is that how you say that? Isn't doing much, no parents on campus. Concordia has a small garden and the parents are doing what they can. I reached out to Truman and they want to get a garden going, but they need to find a parent volunteer to take charge. I keep checking in with the garden leaders. I'll see what we can do. Uh, Sarah Gould. All right, thanks, Michelle. Um, I, I hope that there will be some information in the newsletter um, so that it'll be easy to figure out where to volunteer for the junior gardens. Thank you, junior gardeners, sorry. Um, okay, so I think now the time has come. Carol, tell me if I'm wrong, um, but now the time has come to do our prize drawing, correct? Yes, Excellent. and here are everybody's names. I double checked them. There were 39 of you, I 38, not counting Corey. So this first drawing um, will be for a gift certificate for $25 to Smith's Chocolates, and Bob will pick. This is, this is the gift certificate. <laughs> it's really weird with the background. Okay, and the winner is Lisa Spinelli. Woohoo, Lisa! Woohoo! All right. The okay. chocolate lady. Way to go. Congratulations, Lisa. Thank you very much. Yay. It's, good well, to, it's good to see all you guys. <laughs> uh, Lisa and the and the other future winners will figure out after the meeting how to how to get these gift certificate gift certificates to you. Thank you. Okay. Congratulations, Lisa. The second, second drawing, this will be for a $25 gift certificate to Shore Gardens that we all know and love. And the winner is Nina Ackman. Oh, Nina Ackman. And Nina, are you still there? Nina Ackman. Have yeah. To be here to have to be present to win. <laughs> she's, she's there. She's yeah. just a name up there. I am. It took me a while to unmute. Thank you very much. Thank That's you. lovely. Good deal. Everybody, I don't know if you're if you know Nina. Um, she's pretty new to the garden club, but she's been very active um, of late. She was in the beach, the beach cleanup. I think she helped with civic beautification. She made a donation to FAM. So congratulations, Nina. Thank you. I'm really grateful to be part of this club. Awesome. And today's presentation was exactly what I needed to know. Great. So, okay, the third drawing is for a $50 gift certificate to the seller. And Bob will. By the, by the way, the seller has done a fantastic job helping us um, with the garden tour, having, having awesome food spreads for the garden tours. Okay, so this $50 gift certificate to the seller goes to Tanya Johnson. Woo, Tanya! All right, congratulations, wow. Tanya. Wow, thank you. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm, that's so fun. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank awesome. you. Excellent. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Congratulations, winners. So, um, so the Garden Club was really pleased to be able to support our local San Clemente businesses. Um, and shore gardens and the cellar in particular have been very, um, very helpful for the for the garden club. So we're happy to be able to give back. And um, and Lisa and Nina and Tanya, congratulations! That is thank you again. Thank you. Good to see yeah. you guys. Hey, Sam. And Sarah. now I'd like to introduce our final little thing. Yeah, Cindy. Cindy's going to introduce our uh, closing entertainment. Yes. I found this group OC Sound, and since we are not meeting at the Telega Golf Course for a lovely lunch, this is what they sent us. So enjoy. 
All right. Goodbye, everyone. Merry Christmas. Happy New Merry Year. Christmas. And enjoy this YouTube video. It's short. It's uh, two minutes. Yeah. Aww. You'll like it. Oh, we'll see if it catches up here. <laughs> Don't have any sound. Uh, I think we all have to sing ourselves. <laughs> um, yeah, Stephen, any way to get? One second. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> we wish you a Merry Christmas. <laughs> That was that was cute. Maybe next year we'll have OC Sound Chorus to yeah. entertain Merry a Christmas. live person. Yeah. So Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Uh, we're thrilled that you could join the Zoom meeting. Oh, I, I can make one quick announcement. We um, next oh, okay, next month um, we will be having another Zoom presentation on January sixth, our regular business day, and we have invited Fred Clark to come and talk to us about uh, his black orchid that he hybridized. We had Fred speak to us um, a couple times already. He's, he spoke mm -hmm. to us about Rhinoculus and about um, the trip to Venezuela that he took with orchids. So he's a great yeah. speaker and he yeah. has experience doing Zoom presentations, so it should be really good. So I hope to he's, see all of you there. He's the flower the Carlsbad flower fields. Yes. Right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Happy holidays. Thank you for wearing all your Santa hats. And bye, your bye. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you, Stephen, for running the Zoom conference for us. Anytime, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Weege. Bye bye. Bye.